Hi, welcome to Listening Well. I'm Dr. Rihanna Elise Anderson, and today we have a very special guest. I'm excited to welcome Chelsea Cutler to our conversation. Hi, Chelsea. Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thank you. How about yourself? Good. Thank you guys for having me. So excited to talk with you today. So we're diving into some tough stuff today. Our conversation is going to be social media, depression, and anxiety, and I'm so excited to talk with you as such a vocal advocate of mental health and social media in particular. So I'm really excited to talk with you today. So we were just catching up on where we were from, and I think it's just really important to get into the most important question, which is what is your favorite food in New York right now? Let's just start there and then we'll get to some other stuff. That is the most important question. So yeah. speaking about Italian food, as we just were, I would say that it's a bit of a controversial take but Carbone is probably my favorite restaurant in the city. And for something a bit lower key, I would say Tompkins Square Bagels are the best bagels. You're sharing foods that often make people feel really good. So carbs are, are biggie. Um, the things that we do to ensure that we're feeling well, we're feeling full, and we're very mindful of that. Um, and our conversation today is really interesting because we are talking about social media, which is a habit now that people are picking up that they don't even realize what they're putting into their bodies, right? So it is, it's interesting to think about the contrast between that really great food that you started with and this, I don't, I don't know if I want to say malnourishing, but, but we're doing something to our bodies and to our minds when we're consuming something like social media without thinking about it. So is that a fair thing to, to say or to think through? Definitely. I. It's funny that you say it without even realizing it, because I do think that so much of the time in my personal experience that I'm on social media, I'm weirdly conscious of mm. the fact that I'm engaging with it. And uh, I, you know, a lot of the times I'm wasting time that could be better spent doing other things. And I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm pretty aware of how it makes me feel. And that all being said, it can feel just so compulsive and so addicting. Yeah, it's a, a great distinction to make, right? That I do think for some people, there is this unconsciousness to it. There's just a, my phone is right there. Let me just put my finger on the app. Let me get on there. But to your point, and, and also some of the things we'll be talking about, for certain occupations or for certain people who feel like I have to get on here all the time, I have to be really mindful about what I'm doing. I know what it feels like when I'm on there, and yet it's still a part of some of the things that I have to do. Um, so let's let's kind of dive in there because I know you've spoken really clearly about what that's like in the music industry to have to or to feel like you have to produce this content. Um, and so I just want folks who may not have heard your your statements or your thoughts about this before just learn a bit about your take so for someone who really enjoyed the slow and intentional rollout from your management team to a you have to produce content every day like what has that shift felt like or been like for you and, and just let us know a bit about what you've been saying and doing about it yeah i think that at the end of the day the industry landscape is going to shift and evolve and leave you behind whether you like it or not. And mm -hmm. I think that my team and I had to have a lot of conversations about essentially, you know, saying, okay, this is the game. We have, at the end of the day, if we want to be successful in it, we do have to play that game. And I, and I think for us, much of the conversation revolved around how do we do this in a way that feels sustainable and healthy not so it, it wasn't so much you know are we gonna buy into this it was all right we have to buy in how are we gonna do it in a way that feels okay because you're right social media is such a big part of so many jobs and and careers and there's not really a good way around it so the best thing to figure out is the best way to go through it and yeah the transition to to you know, rolling out this record and really deciding to engage in it. It was definitely challenging. It took me, I mean, we, we've been working with our digital team at the label for, you know, about a year and a half 
maybe even two years at this point, and it's still, you know, it's still a learning curve, and it's still an adjustment, figuring out, you know, not, you know, it's not like you're commodifying your everyday life, but you're certainly thinking, what parts of my everyday life can I turn into content, which can feel pretty exhausting. And, and like I said, that's just the game right now. And there's, there's really no way around it. So the best, you know, the biggest conversation that we've had and it's ever evolving is, you know, what, what are the best practices to make sure, you know, we all feel like it's sustainable and I feel like it's healthy. And I think that's probably the most important way to approach it because with so many industries and so many careers right now, it's a bit obtuse to think that you can avoid it altogether and and that you can just disengage and and not have a social media presence. And I, you know, I think there are people who do that successfully, but I think for a lot of people, it's kind of the primary way to market and the primary way to reach your audience and reach new audiences. So for me, at least that, yeah, again, it, you know, I know I'm being slightly redundant, but it wasn't much of a conversation of, you know, are, are we going to do this? It was, you know, how can we do this in a way that feels right? Yeah. Well, well, let's dive in a bit because you did make the decision to give it some distance, right? You, you said that a break is really important for your mental health. And I would imagine there are a lot of people who don't feel like they can say that or, or choose not to. So what was it that gave you the inspiration or the, um, the strength, right, to be able to make that assertion and to stick with it? I think for starters, it was definitely a challenging decision. I think something that has something that social media has contributed to is the cyclical nature of the entertainment industry. And, and honestly, so many industries right now feel really cyclical because of social media. And so there's always kind of this fear that if you step away, will you still have the same audience when you come back? And obviously we were looking, it's not, you know, it's not like we were considering a two year break here. We were looking at a few months, but so that was kind of an initial question. And I think for us, we felt like the answer was probably yes. If we take some time away, we've put in a lot of hard work in the last few years, there's going to be an audience still there. And given that privilege, is this something that I feel like would really benefit me? And again, the answer was yes. And Stepping away felt amazing. Honestly, I think it gave me a new perspective on how I want to interact with social media because so much of the apps are designed to keep you locked in and and keep you using the app. And I don't think we take a lot of time to think, how do I want to use this app? How is this app supposed to serve me? And yeah, taking time away really did give me that opportunity, which was really nice. Chelsea, you're hitting on so many amazing points right there. There's so much data, so much research that's showing, particularly for young kiddos, but also young adults and and adults writ large, that depression, stress, anxiety, all of these things are ticking up the more hours we spend on apps. Like, There's no question that there's a really strong correlation and linkage between these two things. And I love that you're talking about this intentionality to say, to ask this question, what does it feel like when I step away? Does it ruin me, right? Is my whole career going to fall apart? Am I going to not have friends? Or like, what are people going to say? You tested all of that and you said it felt great. Totally. I love that for you. And that's a brilliant... Yeah, I love that for you. And I, I think it's important to note that for a lot of creators, it may not feel as secure to be able to take a step back. So I definitely think that we were in a major, we were at an advantage to kind of have an audience that we knew would would stick around for a few months. So I definitely say all of this, you know, not at all to dismiss creators who maybe are just starting out or only a few years in and, and there's still like such a constant pressure and demand for content from them. So I recognize that's a really challenging position to be in too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I'm struck though by what we know happens when we're on it more and more. Right. So it's, it's a fear that if I leave this thing, this is what's going to happen. But by being on it, 
I'm also exposing myself to more stress and to more anxiety and, and leading myself to make these comparisons between folks. So it, certainly there are industries that are going to have that more than others. But for the everyday person, like there's so much that is leading us to have this negative mental health as a result of social media. And, and so it's just interesting to hear that conundrum that people are having that if I'm, if I go away, these things will happen, but no, actually, because you're on it, it could be more exposure to those challenges, right? Definitely. Yeah. So you were able to make a decision that was really healthy for you. You said it was a good experience for you, which again, I'm thrilled to hear about. And I'm curious how that impacted your work. So that time away, that ability to restore, to rejuvenate, what did it do for your creative ability, your work, your, your uh, performance? I think that it was really liberating. When we are constantly on social media, I think two things happen. Thing one is when you're putting out content, whether it's TikToks, Instagrams, you know, lives, whatever format it's in, you are constantly thinking about how many likes it's getting, the engagement percentages. There's a lot of data. We have data, way more data than we need about how things are performing. And so every time you post a TikTok, every time you post an Instagram, a tweet, you're sh it's, like you're, it's like you're shooting your shot into the abyss and hoping it lands. And because of the nature of these apps and virality, you're obviously not going to land more times uh, than mm -hmm. you'll land. And so you're kind of in, in a lot of ways facing rejection pretty much every day. You're looking for these mm. dopamine reactions that you're, you know, you're just not going to get. And that's, it's kind of like gambling, honestly. It's, it's really yeah, similar sure. to, to betting or gambling. And the second piece of it is you are also consuming everybody else's engagement. So you see how many likes another artist mm. or another creator has gotten, or you see mm. their videos going viral. You see they're posting about their, their sold out tour, their record that's gone platinum. Mm. And so you kind of have this one side where you are judging yourself on how your success is going on social media. And then you're constantly inundated by everyone else's success. And mm. that all has a really negative impact on output and creativity and to take a step away from that and make art just because I wanted to felt really freeing and really nice. And it felt light. Oh, I just love that. I, I, first of all, you're taking my job so I can just sit here and listen to you since you're throwing out stats, <laughs> you're throwing out all the good stuff. We love that. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely just like dopamine. It's just like the hit that we get from a drug or gambling like it's you're you're absolutely spot on there and designed as such right right um, particularly for the growing brain where they are looking for validation everywhere they're trying to figure out who they are and so again being able to look at what other people are doing what is the success of this it's absolutely going to frame how they see themselves and how they're going to function so you're hitting all, all of my points. I can just take a nap on this couch. You've got it. You know, I've been able to listen to some of your amazing music, and I'm not sure how much of this came out of that break, but I'm wondering if there's a song right now that really lays out your mental health journey or your anything about um, your current state or what you've been through. Just what's a song that comes to mind for you that, that really talks about uh, your mental health space we wrote a song for my album called hunting season that i think is it's a really good reflection of of how i've kind of felt in the midst of social media and and just in my depression in general and i think that essentially for me writing that song i kind of wanted to write about uh I, I wanted to write about how helpless it can feel to have depression in the in the midst of the world right now and how it, I kind of yeah. felt like a deer in the woods at in hunting yeah. season and you're just kind of yeah. you know you're the victim in that situation and and I think there are a few lines that stand out to me there and one in particular is my legs are so tired how is everybody running and I feel like mm. Mm. just given the nature of 
not only social media, but just also how, you know, fast paced it can feel to be in such a capitalist society. It, it's just exhausting. And there's so much emphasis put on, you know, productivity and output and success. Yeah, it's really, it feels really unnatural and unsustainable to me. Um, so that's, mm-hmm. yeah, that's just one that we wrote for this record that I really liked and um, is probably the most kind of recent attempt that I've done to talk about that stuff. Yeah, Chelsea, what a what a really great analogy there when you're, I'll, I love being transparent and, and vulnerable myself. So I just experienced something in my own life and the feeling that I have right now in my mind and my body is such a perfect illustration of what you just said, where like people are laughing and I'm like, how is it possible that people can find joy in this moment? Or like, you know, my, I want to get up and organize the clothes that are just on the floor right now. And I haven't been able to get that energy. So I love the way that you just visualized that for me, that that's exactly, my legs are just like, man, they're just little putties, you know? Totally. <laughs> yeah. No, that's that's such a helpful illustration, and I, I believe so many of your listeners and the folks listening to this are going to be able to relate to that. As we wrap up, we talked a lot about the challenges of social, so I just want to give us the opportunity to, to think through what are some of either the benefits or the joys that you've experienced with this and how we might how social might evolve into something that can be beneficial for others. So I just want to give you some space to to think through what's been a bright spot about social. At the end of the day, it is wonderful, I think, to have a platform where you can interact with other people. You know, I do, in my heart of hearts, believe that, you know, most people are inherently good and being able to interact with other people and share good ideas and good, you know, have have good discourses it's really important you know I'm personally skeptical about how social media will evolve because at the end of the day it's driven by capitalism and by you know their their objective is keeping people on the platform so I'm probably not the best person to answer that but I do think you know at at the end of the day I'm an optimist and like I said I think it's a, it's an awesome way for people to connect and share ideas. Uh, so many artists and so much art is discovered on these platforms. It's an awesome way to break down the barriers of entry to a lot of different industries. You can learn so much. It's so informative. Honestly, I've learned a lot about current events, even just through people sharing information and videos, you know, obviously it's very important to fact check and, and, and see where you're getting that information from. But at the end of the day, I think that, you know, the transportation of ideas is ne- is never really a bad thing. I, th- I think, you know, having dialogue and having disagreements and agreements is, is all very important. So I am an optimist about it. Yeah. 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 What we, I think one of the connecting threads that we've had in, in the interviews we've done thus far is that, connection is a beautiful thing and being able to disconnect mindfully is important and you've demonstrated both of those today how it can bring us together with other people but also disengaging when we need to for our own mental health is critical as well absolutely that's where most of my hope lies i think you know i'm skeptical like i said about the apps ever you know moving in a way that encourages healthy disconnection but but I do think there's a lot that we as the consumer can learn and, and structure around that. Chelsea Cutler, what a pleasure to have you on Listening Well today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. And again, I'm Dr. Rihanna Elise Anderson, wishing you well. We'll see you next time. 